Hello and welcome to Red Deer Public Library's Health Cafe in partnership with Primary Care Network Red Deer. Today's Health Cafe is a postpartum mental health and I will be passing this on to Michelle Abbott and Ivy Persons. Thank you, Alyssa. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Red Deer Primary Care Network's Health Cafe on postpartum mental health. My name is Michelle Abbott, and I am a registered nurse with the Red Deer Primary Care Network's Pregnancy and Babies Program. And I am honored and privileged to support patients with their health and wellness goals during preconception, during pregnancy, and into that first year postpartum. I am an advocate for maternal mental health screening and that support that follows. And I am grateful for this opportunity to present today's Health Cafe with a colleague from Alberta Health Services, Ivy Parsons. And I'll turn it over to Ivy to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Ivy Parsons. I'm with Alberta Health Services Addiction and Mental Health with the Enhanced Services for Women program. We are a program for expectant and postpartum moms seeking support for addiction and mental health. We offer individual counseling and group support, and we are a free service here in Red Deer. If you have any questions during the presentation today, please put them in the chat box and we will save some time at the end to answer those questions. So today we are here to discuss postpartum mental health, sometimes referred to as the fourth trimester. But just when you thought you reached the finish line of pregnancy, you discover there is one more trimester to get through. This session is a brief introduction on the transition and adjustment into motherhood. The postpartum adjustment period can be challenging as new mothers navigate low moods, sleepless nights, and anxiety. We want to talk about this today to bring awareness in our community of how important this topic is and to encourage women to access supports they may need so women do not struggle in silence. Today's session focuses on new moms because we know how much information is out there on caring for your new baby but we know moms are still getting missed. We want moms to know that today, we want to start with you. It can seem strange or conflicting to care for your own mental health when there is a lot of pressure to have to focus solely on the caring of your baby. This can overshadow a mom caring for or even prioritizing her own needs. It's important to remember a mom's mental wellness sets the foundation for their children's future and their own mental health. A woman is at the highest risk in her lifetime of developing a new mental illness within the first year after having a baby. Studies indicate that one in five women will experience a postpartum mood disorder, and 50% of these women would have experienced symptoms of anxiety and or depression during their pregnancy. This is for a variety of reasons, such as hormones, physical changes to the body, worries about the baby's development in utero, worries about pregnancy loss or a history of experiencing loss, feeling overwhelmed and unprepared, worries about labor and delivery and or an unplanned pregnancy. Not surprisingly, the pandemic and COVID-19 has increased the demand for services, which is evidenced by a recent study out of the University of Alberta, which demonstrated that one in three women currently is requiring support postpartum. Getting support in pregnancy for your mental health decreases the need for mental health support postpartum. The sooner you ask for help, the sooner you can move through the season of motherhood. 60% of women have no prior history of mental health concerns to alert them. And left, if left untreated, 30% of women will remain chronically symptomatic. And 78% put their family's health and wealth being before their own. Our hope is that you will leave this session feeling comfortable and confident that you have the resources and tools for your mental wellness. Know you are not alone and how to access both professional and community support. The fourth trimester refers to the first three months after having a baby, and it is a time of so much change. We want to normalize some of the shared experiences many women go through and acknowledge that just because there are others out there going through the same things, it doesn't make it any less difficult. This is a period of total adjustment and learning. You too, as a mom, have just been born into a new version of yourself. You have to get to know this new you each time you welcome a new child into your home. We understand that our bodies change, 
as do our hormones, but sometimes we forget that emotionally we also change. This isn't always a negative thing. Many, many major life areas are impacted when you've become a mother. It's a lot of change to go through in a very short amount of time. The areas we will focus on today include a mother's mood. We want to share some of the most common things that we see with women's mental health postpartum. The role of sleep, hormones, adjustment, and of course, we will end with talking about supports that are available. I want you to share an example of how anxiety can present in the postpartum period to both normalize and highlight a common experience. Amanda's experience is an excerpt taken from a book called Dropping the Baby and Other Scary Thoughts, Breaking the Cycle of Unwanted Thoughts in Parenthood. Amanda said she was never a worrier until she had a baby. When describing herself, she said, I used to be such a go with the flow kind of person. Nothing ever bothered me. But since Aiden was born, it's like my nerve endings are all frayed. Everything inside my body pulsates. I feel like I'm vibrating. Everything seems magnified. I'm always on high alert. The baby makes one sound and I jump to attention like a soldier ready for battle. What if something's wrong? What if he's sick? What if he needs to go to the hospital? It feels I will never sleep through the night again. Sometimes all of this feels like the greatest gift. Other times it feels like I'm imprisoned by my own life. There are a lot of different words or terminology you might hear in reference to the mother's mental health after having a baby. Some of these terms used today to describe the adjustment challenges and distress some women experience in the postpartum period include postpartum blues or baby blues, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum psycho psychosis, postpartum mood disorder, perinatal distress, postpartum stress syndrome. I'm going to turn it over now to Ivy and she will share more information about some of these different terms. You're muted, Ivy. Oh, there you go. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So to start, many of you have probably heard of the baby blues and postpartum depression. So I want to differentiate the two to help moms know when to seek support. So the baby blues um, refers to the sadness and crying spells that usually start within the first three days after delivery and can last up to 14 days. Moms may also experience poor concentration, irritability. It occurs in about 50 to 80% of new moms. So it is quite common. And many women interpret this period of significant hormone dysregulation as a um, postpartum mood disorder. What we like is for moms to, we want to encourage moms to wait a few weeks before coming to that conclusion. Most women will feel much better after a few weeks. But when symptoms persist, the woman may be experiencing postpartum depression. So this can occur anytime within the first year. And this shows up in many ways, including sadness, difficulty bonding with baby, loss of pleasure or interest in things that once brought you joy, loss of libido, thoughts of suicide, or more commonly, these dark thoughts show up from moms who say things like, my family would be better off without me. It can also show up like exhaustion, irritability, tearfulness, and reactivity. Um, postpartum anxiety is under the umbrella of postpartum depression, but we're going to talk about that separately because it there's lots to say on that topic. So um, the less common but equally important for us to share information on is postpartum psychosis. And we rarely see women, but um, one in a thousand women may experience this and there really isn't anything that a mom could do to prevent it. So I want to share today just what that might look and feel like. Uh, moms may experience hallucinations, delusions, or inaccurate perceptions of reality and really behaving in ways that are out of character. So Postpartum psychosis is always a medical emergency and requires immediate intervention, which is usually hospitalization or medication. And I know this can be scary, but we want you to be informed. And then we're going to talk about the big elephant in the room, which is postpartum anxiety. Postpartum anxiety is one of the most common symptoms we see in women here in Red Deer through the Enhanced Services uh, for Women program. And anxiety is a natural adaptive response we experience when we feel unsafe or threatened. Um, 
we perceive many kinds of threats. Some can be specific and real, some more vague, like a general sense something bad will happen. Um, we um, may also have an anxious response to a threat we're imagining in our minds, like picturing something bad happening. So anxiety can show up in our bodies, in our minds, and in our actions and behaviors. And so um, in our body, what that looks like is increased heart rate, sore throat, tight chest, shallow breathing, loss of appetite, difficulty falling or staying asleep. In our mind, the way that shows up is really like racing thoughts, um, racing thoughts about the future, imagining worst case scenarios, ruminating, worrying, or obsessing over certain things. And then in our actions and behaviors, what this can look like is avoiding certain situations and activities, people, places, and things, avoiding them, or over trying to over control, you know, when the baby naps and the environment in which the baby naps in. And, or it's always asking others for constant reassurance, checking things repeatedly, being extra careful or vigilant. Most commonly in new moms, we see perfectionist tendencies that show up as this bar of standards and shoulds and expectations, and that bar just keeps moving. So what I want you to hear is the scary thoughts that moms have postpartum are what we call intrusive thoughts, and these are actually a symptom of anxiety. And studies show that 90% of women experience intrusive thoughts after having a baby. So we know that this is a symptom of anxiety, but what many people don't know is that intrusive thoughts are actually what's called ego dystonic, meaning the exact opposite of your values and beliefs. So research so shows that these thoughts do not lead to action, but the thought is more risky to the mom than the baby. So there are common themes, and we know that this can be really distressing if they show up at all, but we want to share the common themes because there's so many times I share this with moms and they're like, I'm so happy you shared this. I thought I was alone. I thought I was a monster. I was scared of myself. So some of the themes we see are that moms have fears the baby will stop breathing, particularly at night, fears of dropping their baby, specifically while walking down a set of stairs, fears of getting into a car accident with the baby, fears of germs or baby getting sick, and a preoccupation or fears obsessively of your own health, your own mortality once you become a mother. And these are not just worries. Many women develop obsessions and compulsive behaviors that impact daily functioning as a means of trying to just control and mitigate these, uh, this anxiety and these symptoms. So um, many women also experience thoughts that scare them, uh, thoughts that they never thought they would have of harming their baby because um, this really makes moms start to mistrust their own what mistrust their own body and what they might do. So mom, if you're aware of these thoughts and they disturb you, we understand this is really distressing. And so I think awareness really is the key. And um, we want you to be able to talk about it, to let it lose its power over you. We know this is stressful and scary. So our one tip today is um, if you, you know, not to be scared, ask for help. And, you know, our scary thoughts are only what they make, what we make them mean. And if you have awareness and you ask for help, then you're on the right track. Talk to your doctor, talk to a loved one, talk to a counselor, and we can help you with strategies on how to navigate through these difficult um, and scary thoughts. So birth trauma, um, we want to talk about birth trauma because it is just such a big piece of a woman's experience, many women's experience. So the next three slides, we're going to talk about the less commonly talked about um, impact, how moms think, feel, and cope. And um, birth trauma can happen to anyone at any phase of the childbearing process. It's not about the way birth looks, it's really about the way birth feels. So the ingredients that tell us if the birthing experience was traumatic is what the mom thinks and feels, not what a health professional deems to be traumatic. It can um, be an actual or threat of serious injury or the perception that the baby was at risk, even if there was, it was not medically recognized. So trauma is in the eye of the beholder. So some examples of psychological birth trauma might include postpartum hemorrhage, placenta privia, episiotomy, emergency C-section, failed epidural. And some examples of psychological birth trauma could include the experience of feeling ignored or treated rudely, being or feeling pressured into a procedure, unexpected beginnings and COVID-19 and everything that has changed with the birthing process. So 
birth trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder are not the same. A woman does not have to be diagnosed with PTSD to prove that her birth was traumatic and has had a negative impact in some way. 9% of birthing women will receive a PTSD diagnosis, but most women will not meet the criteria for a clinical diagnosis. However, 46% of women describe their birthing experience as traumatic. So there's the traumatic event, and then there's the reaction. And we may have similar experiences, but that does not mean we'll process those experiences in the same way. So our histories are all unique. Therefore, the way we process events and experiences is are unique as well. So our hope is that you reach out for support um, to help feel safe in your body again and know that your body did not fail you and that there is no timeline on the worth that your story holds. Your experience is valid and this would be another time to reach out to get support if you're having a hard time reconciling what that experience was like. So now we're going to talk about the role of sleep or lack of sleep in relation to postpartum mental health. So Moms face many factors that contribute to sleep struggles. Sleep disturbances often start in pregnancy and before the baby is born. Mom spends lots of time preparing for the baby by considering what type of bassinet or what type of sleep sack she might need. And what many of us don't spend our time on is forming a plan for our own sleep. It is harder than I could ever imagine to sleep when the baby sleeps. So I'm not sure if those of you who can relate, um, our bodies are wired to the every little noise of our babies. And it's important to note that even sleep disruption produces the same response as complete periods of sleep deprivation. And this increases, increases cortisol levels. Cortisol is your stress hormone. So without sleep, you're constantly operating on a short fuse, reacting to things as though there's a fire alarm going off in your body. And that's because our stress hormones make us actually feel like there's a fire alarm going off in your body. <laughs> so there's a lot of pressure for uh, women to a lot of women feel pressured to maintain part of their own identity, have a life, and carry out the responsibilities of parenting. And a lot of this comes at the cost of sleep. So sleep deprivation can be problematic at the point if you notice your sleep patterns are unrelated to baby and if you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. We encourage you to connect for support. So we hope that you can share the responsibility of your infant's sleep with someone and treat your own sleep as just as important as your baby's. Did you know that your hormones fall off of a cliff after pregnancy? And this is another big contributor to the way we uh, bounce forward after having a baby. And this change is considered um, the most significant and fastest hormone change any human can experience. So the change in estrogen and progesterone can have a significant impact on moods, cravings, energy, stress hormones, and your th thyroid and how you feel day to day. These, hormones chain, uh, these hormonal changes are supposed to be temporary, but nutrient depletion, lack of sleep, high stress, and all the things that modern motherhood has set us up for make that road to recovery look different for each person. So hormones are not the root cause of the reason you don't feel like yourself. They respond to their environment. So other factors that it can uh, impact this are breastfeeding, which plays a role in the hormonal hijack. Uh, lactation is in initiated when estrogen falls and the hormone prolactin, which has risen during pregnancy, is no longer blocked. So any disruption to this process can dysregulate hormones, making the impact on mood very much biologically driven and not solely situational. What baby needs, baby gets from mom through breastfeeding, further depleting mom, which can impact hormones. So lastly, after pregnancy, thyroid functioning. Your thyroid is vital, a vital hormone gland and responsible for your metabolism and the growth and development of your body. It can take time to return to pre-pregnancy levels. And really the big takeaway here is that this will not last, but your body does need time. It took how long for you to grow a human and it's going to take some time for your body to readjust. And the return of your menstrual cycle will aid in this process and just be patient with yourself and ask for help if you feel like you're needing extra support. Thank you, Ivy, for sharing all that information. 
Now, if you are struggling with your mental health during pregnancy and or postpartum, please don't assume these feelings will just go away. Don't hesitate to ask for help or waste precious energy feeling guilty. Please don't think this is what being a mother feels like or let your anger, fear, confusion, panic, pain, or any other symptom define who you are. Don't believe your misleading thoughts or doubt your ability to be a good mother. Please don't wonder if your scary thoughts are too scary to tell someone. Please do tell someone. Please don't skip meals, even if you're not hungry. And don't underestimate the healing power found in your supportive relationships. What we do encourage you to do if you're struggling is to please remember it's so important to ask for help. Please understand you will not always feel this way. Let someone that you trust know that what you're feeling and what you're thinking and to believe in your ability to heal and feel better. Please be kind to yourself and surround yourself with people who care about you. And most important, remember to breathe. Also remember it's okay to survive and not thrive. Survival means taking care of you, your basic needs and taking care of the baby. When we do an expectations check for ourselves, it's always helpful to consider what is imminent and what can wait. For example, mom eating meals is imminent or, or essential, but mom washing the floors can wait. And survival means just that, survival. Don't forget you are the expert of you and you have so much innate intuitive information, but you are new to this role and you are learning and practice makes progress not perfect, as the bar of perfection will just make you suffer more greatly. If you experience or are experiencing any of the symptoms, thoughts, or feelings that we've discussed today, please know you are not alone and help is available. There's counseling, there's medications, workshops, support groups, and connections with other moms. There are many options that can help you feel better. I'm going to turn it back over to Ivy again so she can share some information about some specific resources. So I want to share with you information on the Mother's First Toolkit. So a group of representatives from across Canada who are passionate about maternal mental health came together to develop this toolkit out of Halifax, Nova Scotia. And we have been lucky enough to partner with some of our colleagues in Lloydminster and other areas of Alberta to take their toolkit and have a panel of moms go through it and pick out what they thought was most helpful for them. So if you go to this website, you're going to find a PDF version of this toolkit. You'll also find rural tabs. And if you are from somewhere outside of Red Deer, click on that tab and you're going to find information on your local mental health and public health um, office with their contact information. But what you're going to find in here is information for new moms on self-care, on general health, exercise and movement, rest and sleep, relax stress management, emotional coping skills, um, strategies, signs and symptoms for knowing if you are struggling with your maternal mental health. So if you were to go, I would really encourage everyone to check out our Facebook page, Mother's First Red Deer and our Instagram. Instagram and Facebook have uh, local supports, programs, and connections with all of the community events that support moms. And so we've created a little bit of a a network so that moms can find this spot and launch off and find all the other ways to get support. So I want to show you specifically on the next slide, one of the pages that are one of the sections that are in this book. And here's a sample of a few of the tools that are available. And so you, um, what you'll find is a perinatal assessment and a mother's checklist. So there's a mental health checklist. And please note the wording is really reflective of language that's used by mothers. So by framing it like, am I acting like myself? Am I saying things or doing things that seem out of character or not like my usual self will help you assess if you may need extra support. So if you're not sure after hearing us today, please take a look at this toolkit and go into this section here called mental health uh, checkup checklist. And if you feel like you're answering check marks to a lot of these questions, please don't hesitate after today to reach out to us. 
So mama, what we want you to know is you can't pour from an empty cup and we're just giving you permission to take care of yourself with as much compassion as you would for your new baby. Thank you, Ivy. That comes to the end of our presentation and we'd happy to see if there's any questions in the chat. Don't think there's any at the moment, but we'll may maybe wait a minute here and see if there's any that pop up. Any on your side, Alyssa? I don't see any at the moment. Oh, we have a hello. A hello back. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. And anyone that is on today, I'm not sure, I can't remember, sorry if Alyssa mentioned it, but these um, health cafes are recorded and can be found on, I'm probably sure the library, but also on the Red Deer Primary Care Network website under patient resources. We have all of uh, the health cafes that we've recorded and they are there for watching. So if you know somebody who missed this presentation and would benefit from the information, please direct them to our website, Red Deer Primary Care Network.